morning, Boulevard family. You know, outside of the scriptures and the church, being a parent has taught me more about God than anything else in my life. You know, especially during this week. It's really hard to look away from the news. It's hard to, check, to not check your phone, looking for the newest updates, some good news in there. I'm just watching TV over and over and over, just waiting for the newest, best update. But you know what brought me the most security in one of the craziest times of my life? It wasn't a press conference. It wasn't a tweet. It wasn't even from the President of the United States. Believe it or not, it wasn't words from a medical professional. It was this book. I know it might be difficult to see, but it's called God Knows You. And it's a book that I was reading to my youngest son, Ike, before bed earlier this week. And it's one of those flip-up books where it says something on one side, and then you flip it, and it tells you something on the other. And through the book, here's what it says. I want to read it to you. It says, God knows your name. It's really true. You are his child, and he made you. God knew you well before your birth, before you took one breath on earth. At this point of the book, I'm thinking, yes, Isaac needs to know this, even from the age of two. The book goes on and says, God knows the name of every star, and you're more special than they are. God knows your heart and what you do. He knows you more than you know you. At this point, I'm feeling, man, this is a pretty good reminder for even somebody like me. He goes on and says this, God knows his sheep. You are his lamb. You are precious to the great I am. God knows your thoughts and what you say. He knows your needs before you pray. As I'm reading now these statements, here's what I'm thinking to myself. Hold it together, Jim. Hold it together. Hold it together. Goes on and finishes the book like this. God knows you, child, inside and out. He knows you well, without a doubt. God says you're mine. And he loves you so. He'll never, ever let you go. And this is a children's book. It's for children. Right, but as I read this to my son, I, I felt my emotions welling up as all the craziness is going on. And in light of today's message, I can't help but think about this book, that God knows you. And this isn't a book for children. This is a truth for every believer out there that needs to be reminded that in this craziest time, God knows you and God loves you. I have another story that's going to connect to the message here. My other son, Zeke, when he was just a baby, he was a very difficult young child to take care of. And all newborn parents know the reality of whenever you take the baby and the baby falls asleep in your arms. Then comes the next difficult step. You have to transfer said baby into the bed without even noticing, without a bump going on, or else the baby is going to wake up. And I remember Jackie and I taking turns. And, and we would switch back and forth on, hey, it's your try, it's your turn, it's your turn. At this point, it's the middle of the night, and I'm rocking Zeke, and he's finally falling asleep. I'd been in the room for so long that actually my eyes had adjusted to the darkness, to so where I could actually see Zeke's face. And as his eyes start to go shut, I think I'm almost there. I'm almost done. It's almost time for me to go back to sleep. And as he's doing that, he starts making even strange noises to show he's in a deeper sleep, and I think I'm even closer. I begin to count to 100 because at 100, I'm going to begin to try and transfer Zeke into his bed. And as I begin to try to transfer Zeke, I get to 80, 81, 82. And that's when Zeke takes his hand, eyes still closed, takes his hand and just starts touching my face. And he starts feeling around my face and I just feel my frustration building. I think, why does he want to touch my face? Why is this baby not sleeping? And the longer that this happened, I. My, my feelings and emotions went from anger to ones of love. Because see, what my son wanted more than anything was to know, is daddy still there? Are you still there? And it gave me comfort to know that my son, while he was still half asleep, just wanted to check. Am I connected to him still? Didn't, he didn't care what time of night it was. He didn't care if he was hungry. He didn't care at that moment. He just wanted to make sure that I was still there. And here in John 15, where, we are, where we're at in our face-to-face -face series, is Jesus is face-to-face -face with his disciples. 
You know, it's already been through, they've already been through a bunch together. They've been through miracles. They've seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They've seen these healings. They've seen these teachings. Thousands of people have come to seeing this guy that the disciples are calling rabbi and Christ. They've been through the good times. They've been through the bad times. And here he comes with his disciples face to face for one of the last times before he's arrested and crucified. And here's what he does is he gives him this message. But this message is not a bunch of self-help stuff. It's not, an, it's not a list of exhaustive instructions, a list of how-tos. His instructions are simple, and it's to the point. And let me tell you, church, it's a little intense. The word that Jesus says over and over in John 15 is this word, remain. That is the key to John chapter 15, is this word, remain. Remain. We're going to read the passage in full, but I, I can't keep going on because um, I don't want you to miss this. An opportunity where I missed something that could have been an addition in my life is when Jack and I first moved to Muskogee, we bought the house that we're currently living in now. We've never owned a house. We didn't have anything to fill the house. And so here's Jackie before children, just bought a new house, doing what people do. Is She's all excited about setting up the house and setting up the rooms, how she wants to set up the rooms. And so I'm at work a lot at that time. And so she's taking care of a lot of that stuff while I'm at work. And she would often surprise me without telling me about new additions she's made to the house. Jackie waited two days before she asked me, Jim, what do you think about the rug? And I sat there, and there was a rug in our living room, and I thought, I've always liked this rug. Why are you asking me that? She goes on to say, no, I'm talking about the 20-foot rug that we have on our wood floor that connects our bedroom to our bathroom. I had not noticed this rug for two entire days, and I had walked on it back and forth many, many times. Sometimes something is so obvious to us, but depending on where we're at mentally, depending on how distracted we are, and honestly, if you're being honest with yourself, how distracted you are right now to hear this message about Jesus and his disciples. One of the very final times he has this word, remain, remain, remain. I don't want you to miss this like I missed my rug. So in John chapter 15, starting in verse 1, what Jesus is going to do is give his disciples this final instruction. And here's how intense he wants to be about it. In just seven small verses, this word remain pops up. 11 times. This is no coincidence. This isn't accident. Jesus isn't stuttering. He's saying, remain in me. Same thing, a word I might use interchangeably is abide. Abide in me. This point is being driven home again and again and again. If you have a Bible at home, I'd really encourage you to open it up, but we should have it on the screens here as well. John 15, starting in verse 1, starts this way. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, there are three statements that Jesus makes right off the bat here with his disciples. First off is, is this, that Christ says, I am the vine. I am the vine. The second one is very obvious. And he says, and God is the gardener. My father, God is the gardener. One thing we need to know as we're reading this passage is you and I, we are the branches. You have the vine, you have the gardener, and you have the branches. Now, as the story continues, we're about to read it in full. Listen to how these things connect. The role of Christ, the role of God. And right now, the important role that we have as believers and followers of him. Don't pull a gym. Don't miss what God is trying to say here. He's telling you to remain. One of the final face-to-face -face encounters that Jesus has is he's telling his disciples, remain in me. Starting in verse 4, Jesus goes on to say this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit 
showing yourselves to be my disciples. As my Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained and remain in his love. I told you this so that your joy may be in you, and or sorry, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this to love one another as I have loved you. Did you catch it? The key to John 15. And if I'm being honest right now, it's your key to walking with Jesus himself. It's the key to being a disciple. It's the key to being a member here at Boulevard Christian Church. If you want to be a God-honoring employee, this is your key. Or a godly mother, a father, a husband, a wife. This is the key to life itself, found here in John 15. But here's another little secret. It's not just found in John 15, but it is scattered throughout the entire New Testament scriptures littered throughout his teachings and throughout the gospel. If you're reading through the New Testament letters from Paul or from Peter, maybe start to underline every time you see in your Bible, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. You may need a couple pins to make it happen. See, this is our key, church. Pandemic or no pandemic, whether we're quarantined or whenever life gets back to normal, this is your key until Christ returns himself. Remain in me have a couple observations from this text. And the first one is this. God cares more about your faithfulness than he does your success. Again, God cares more about your faithfulness than he does your success. If you're sitting at home right now with your family and you're struggling to hear that or believe that statement, that God is more concerned about your faithfulness than he even is your success, I believe there may be one of two problems. First problem is this, that you have difficult time understanding your job description. If you feel pressure of being a follower of Jesus, I think you need to reread your job description as being a follower of him. And John 15 is your job description. You aren't called to be the gardener. You aren't called to be the vine. What do you do? You are the branch. You are called to connect to that vine. Your job, your responsibility, your calling, whatever you want to call it, if you want to be faithful in Christ Jesus, be connected to him. And here's the good news. He takes care of the rest. You don't have to worry about your success because when you remain faithful to God, John 15 makes it apparent. He takes care of the rest. It's not about you. It's not about me. It never has been and it never will be. That we must remain in Christ. That is our job. Maybe you're having a difficult time hearing that God cares about your faithfulness more than your success and your struggle isn't with understanding this job description. There might be a second thing going on, and it might be more difficult to hear. Maybe an issue that you have going on is that you overplay your authority of your role, or maybe you underplay God's authority in his. Now, I know no one wants to admit that. No one wants to say that out loud, but I know it's been a reality in my life. Here is a pastor I've lived my Christian walk believing that my actions and my success were dependent upon me. Let me tell you, church, that's a dangerous place to be. The scripture uses this phrase a lot, fruit. Not just in this, but in different passages. Use it quite a bit. Simply put is this, fruit is basically the work of your labor. What is produced because of the actions that you've done. But this is the part that's important. And you find this in John 15 as well throughout the, throughout the Bible. Not because of you, but because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. See, if you remain in Christ, you will bear fruit. But you, don't, but you have to know that this is an act of trust. This is not an act of activity. Being fruitful is about a relationship. It's never been about just doing the right things. In almost every area of life, we feel this need to make the cut. Right? We have to be good enough, we have to be strong enough, we have to have a good enough personality and have this much talent. And we all desire to see this fruit in our lives, but this passage doesn't emphasize what you do. This passage emphasizes whose you are. Jesus doesn't harp on production here. The only thing he talks about over and over again, 11 times in 7 verses, is not about your production. It's about how connected you are. We believe this lie that sometimes that our production gives us connection. But this is false thinking. 
Think about this, not just with your relationship with God, but with a relationship with your spouse, significant other. What if your wife or your husband only loved you based on what you gave them? You forgot to do the dishes today? Out of the love circle. You didn't bring enough money home this month. I no longer love you. Or how about parents? What do you do with your child? Where's your desire from the connection you have with your son, with your daughter? Is it based off what they give you? Or is it based off who they are? Do you love your child simply because they are your child? And you want nothing more than for your child just to know that you love them. Jesus is saying the exact same thing here. It's not about what you give. It's about whose you are. Don't forget to remain in Christ. If we worry about the connection, God always takes care of the production, the fruit in our lives and our ministry. You see, God doesn't care how good you are. He doesn't care how gifted you are, how rich you are, how poor you are. He cares about how connected to him you are. We usually like to add some kind of application towards the end of our sermons here at Boulevard, but I want to give you something right now. Write this down. Send it in a text to somebody. Send it to a family. Send it to, send it to a friend. Maybe if you're sitting on the couch next to your brother or your sister, text them this right now so it's in your phone and in writing. Here's the application statement for you that I want you to remember and write down. God can do more in one act of faithfulness than I can do in a thousand lifetimes. That God can do more with one act of faithfulness than I or you can do in a thousand lifetimes. Maybe the question that we need to change is, where can I make the biggest impact to where does God want me the most? If you're a student, faithfulness might look like for you committing to personal integrity in your school and in your relationships. For adults, have an integrity at work. Imagine the impact that God can do, not you, whenever you decide to be a person that is faithful in all areas of your life, not just areas that you want to be in. If you're a parent, maybe faithfulness looks like being obedient to God in every area of your life, no matter how mundane or how little it may seem, because you and I both know kids are always watching. For everybody, faithfulness always has and always will continue to be a witness to what God is doing in your life. Sometimes when we hear that word witness, we think that we have to put together a five-page apologetic paper about some controversial issue. When in reality, when you witness for God, you are just open to those around you about what God is doing in your life. Are you being faithful with the small so God can give you more? God can do more in one act of faithfulness than you can do in a thousand lifetimes. Remaining in Christ is not just about what you do. Remaining in Christ is who you are. Second observation is this. A branch is useful, but a stick is useless. A branch is useful, but a stick is useless. Jesus makes this blatantly obvious, that if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into fire, and burned. See, there's a major difference between a branch and a stick. You know, they might be made out of the same material. They may even be the same size or come from the same source. But a branch is always used for growth, for some kind of growth. And a stick is only good for fire. The piercing question we get from this text is, do you make the cut? And the answer to that question is, are you remaining in Christ? Are you in or are you out? One of the greatest mistakes I believe we can make is not always a specific sin, although a specific sin can lead to a downfall. I believe that it's the belief that you and I or anybody can do anything good outside of God. Belief that your good merit actually stands on its own. That your belief of, of, in your life and your hope and your purpose are found outside of the gospel. And this doesn't have to be sinister, evil things. Maybe you, maybe us, we can't be so distracted by busyness or even religious activity that we don't even realize that we're not connected to the power in the first place. Don't be so busy playing Christian that you miss the part of Christ. 
there were some Old Testament heroes that had moments in their lives where they were, did some really faithful and awesome things when they were connected to God. And it wasn't some egregious sin that happened, but it was a simple act which they believed that they could do life outside of God's will or God's authority or God's power. Think about Moses and all the things that Moses did. He went to Egypt, the most powerful country in the world at that time, and overthrew the armies and the government. And the, He saw God bring the plagues down, and he split the Red Sea open. And he's leading the Israelites into the wilderness, and God gives him this command. God says, I want you to speak to the rock, and if you speak to the rock, water will come forth. And as Moses then, if you know Moses' background, he's a, little, he's a little shy when it comes to talking. He doesn't trust his talking ability. So here's what he ends up doing. Instead of speaking to the rock like God asked him to, he decides to strike the rock because that was more inside his comfort zone. Now, this may seem like a little thing, but I believe that it was a big thing in the sense that God, that Moses began to believe he could live his life outside of God's power, God's authority. He was no longer remaining in God, but instead on his own power and authority. And what happened was he was no longer allowed to enter the promised land. Or think about Samson, one of the heroes from the book of Judges. Samson was a big, strong guy, and God gave him this power and gave him in order to throw off the Philistines. And as he's there being able to throw out the Philistines, this power comes from his hair, but we really know it really comes from God. And we talk about this with students all the time and the dumb dating stuff that we do. We use Samson as an example. And he meets this woman named Delilah, Samson and Delilah. As with Delilah, Delilah asked him three different times, where's the source of your strength? And then just so happened the next day, she, had, she tells other people the source of his strength, and then they attempt to get Samson so that he's no longer strong so they can subdue him and kill him. Three different times Samson tells her, and these things happen all the next day. I used to think Samson was just really dumb and just really, like, didn't know girls at all. I used to think Samson was just kind of an idiot. But why would you keep telling her? Eventually he ends up telling her the real source of his strength. I don't think Samson was just dumb with girls. I don't think Samson was just oblivious to what was going on. I think Samson in the moment began to trust his own strength and his own power and his own ability. And so he didn't think the power really came from God. And so when they cut off his hair, Samson lost all of his strength. Think about King David in the Old Testament as well, called a man after God's own heart. But there was a little area in David's life with he, which he thought, but this is for me. You know the story of Bathsheba. We covered it just a couple months ago. And so here's David with Bathsheba, and he thinks, I could just keep this over here, and it won't affect the rest of my life. When in reality, you can't take God out of the picture. God is always there. Remain in Christ, church, because apart from him, you, I, this church, everyone can do nothing. Final point is this. Remaining in Christ does not happen on accident. You don't accidentally fall into abideness or you don't fall into obedience with God. There's no such thing as passive abiding. You can't accidentally fall into it. You don't accidentally fall into remaining in Christ. Maybe every day, every morning, perhaps even every hour, you need to start asking God into your life. Invite him to lead you and your family, your discussions and your thoughts. What if every single day, the first 30 seconds of your drive to work or your drive to the store, wherever you are going, you don't have the radio on, you don't have your music playing, maybe it's in silence, and you ask God for the first 30 seconds, lead me. Help me go where you want me to go, because it's not about my acts of heroism. It's really about what you are going to do through me. What if every time we wash our hands, which we are being instructed to do often, instead of singing whatever catchy song for 20 seconds, you decide to pray. Invite God's presence into your life every time you wash your hands, again, which should be often, because he's there, whether we recognize him or not. But sometimes to abide in him like he's abided in us, we need to make sure to recognize him there. Here's an exercise for you if you want something different. Maybe go through passages in the Bible. Go through the Gospels or New Testament letters. And this whole idea of remaining in Christ, look at all the commands that are given or things to avoid and ask yourself this question. Can I do this or can I avoid this without remaining in Christ? Am I able to keep the commands of Jesus without his actual help? Can I do this or avoid this without God's active hand in my life? And if you think you can do these things on your own, 
I believe your approach, approach is the wrong one. Throughout while I was preparing for this message and knowing it was going to be online, I was doing my own personal study, my own personal reading for myself, and I was reading through Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is speaking during the Sermon on the Mount, and I believe this applies to much as what we're going on today. What you're going through right now, what we are going through as a country and as a world, what we are trying to deal with as a church. And I tried to take this challenge of, can I do this outside of God? So what I want you to do is, I just want to read this to you. It's not going to be on the screens. Honestly, I don't want you even to look at the Bible right now. I want you to sit there, and if you just want to look down and focus on one spot, or even to close your eyes, I want you to hear this story of Jesus. And as Jesus is telling this idea, I want you to really think, can I do this apart from him? In chapter 6, verse 25, he's talking about worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow or stow away or store away in barns, and yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow are thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For pagans run around all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom... And his righteousness, and all these will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. See, this doesn't happen, church, when we don't abide in Christ. You cannot take this Matthew 6 passage about worry, something that everyone is on everyone's radar at this moment. But if you're not abiding in Christ, you can't do this. If you don't believe that God is the source of our power, of our life, you cannot apply even Matthew 6 to your life. I hope you caught this prerequisite that he said. He says, seek first kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these things will be given to you. Seek him first. Then everything else will take its place. Your first and only priority will be to remain in Christ, to abide. And everything else flows through that. Do it first. Remain in Christ. The scriptures tell us this, that God did not give us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but he gives us one of power. How do you tap into that? By remaining in him. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Did you know that same power lives in you? And it lives in me. And it lives in anyone that claims to be a follower of Jesus across this world. How do we tap into that process? How do we tap into that power? By remaining in Christ. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. How do we access that power? By remaining in him. You know, the same Holy Spirit that coursed through the veins of the apostles... That's not the different Holy Spirit that is around today that is active in your life. But how do you partake in that? By remaining in him. You know, we're about to sing a couple songs. The band could come on up. When you're singing here, um, we're going to sing a few more songs to end our service. Uh, When you're singing in your living room right now with your family, or maybe you're in your room and you're on your phone, and we're about to worship, these aren't empty words that mean nothing. But you are joining a host of other people that call Boulevard home, as long as other Christians across our country and across the world that are also singing worship songs to God. Do those words mean anything? You know why the answer is yes. Because we are all a part of this body. We are all a part of God. But you have to do your role. Your role is to remain in Christ. Here's an ending question that I want you to think about for yourself. What role does God play in your life? If you're being honest, what role does God play in your life? Is your life kind of like an actor when they get up and receive an award and God just kind of makes the list 
of all the people that we have to thank because he might feel left out if we don't give him a thank you at the end. Or do we realize, church, that the only reason, reason why you're breathing right now is because God remained in you? The only reason that you have the home that you're sitting in right now or looking at whatever device you're looking at is because God gave that to you. However you're gifted, whether you have a paycheck coming in now or you don't, is it because of him? Do you believe that? Or is this really just all an accident? And really, you're doing pretty good all by yourself. He is the air that we breathe. He's the reason, he's the hope, and he's the life of our entire existence during a crisis or without a crisis. Is Jesus really who he says he is? Is he the vine? If we make him the vine, that makes us the branches. And our only most important duty to do, remain in him. Remain in him, church. Let's pray. Father, I ask right now that we would remain in you. Regardless of the scenarios that are happening, the worries that are in our hearts and our minds, where our kids are at, what our futures hold, I don't want to sound insensitive, but you know this is true, Father. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that we remain and abide in you. God, your, your word is filled with promises about how if we would just seek you first, you'll take care of the rest. That does not promise that our lives will be easy. That does not promise that our lives will be simple. But it promises that our lives will mean something. God, at the end of time, whenever we meet you face to face, we want to hear those words, good job, good and faithful servant. We can hear those words by remaining in you. Give us that same power that flowed through the church. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and the same power that lives today until the end of time. By remaining in you. God, we love you. We sing these songs not because we just like to sing. We sing these songs because we're singing them to the most powerful entity to ever exist. And that power desires a relationship with us. God, thank you for remaining in us. Help us to always remain.